so today we're going to China and we will begin, as we did in India, by looking at a, a typical house. Uh, this is not a working class house, but the house of someone who's reasonably well off. <coughs> And it's a typical street in Beijing, <coughs> as it was when I went there in 1983, before traffic became a problem and before modernization took place. <coughs> and uh, this was a very characteristic street. There are no shops or stores in the street. It is simply plain, and uh, there are a series of houses along it. Each one has a high a wall which stops you seeing inside, <coughs> and a single entrance. And the house we're going into is the one in the foreground. <coughs> when you go in, you are aware of entering an entrance court, and you turn to the left and go through into a transverse courtyard. <coughs> uh, but the point I want to draw attention to is that the main courtyard of the house is actually walled in with a separate entrance. <coughs> and that main courtyard, which has high walls on all sides, is the private part of the house. And it is, as you can see, more or less a square, and it is in the center of the house. <coughs> and it has always a characteristic plan. The entrance is centralized and you go up an, a central path uh, to a hall, which is the main hall of the house at the far end. That access is traditionally and nearly always, almost without exception in China, facing south. That's not surprising, is it? Because it means in winter you're facing the direction of the sun at midday. But there are other reasons for it. Uh, in China, in many parts of China, you get very cold winds from the north. Of course, the north is the direction of darkness and the direction of, of uh, cold. And in addition, uh, it may be important that in, in the early days, uh, invasions tended to take place across the frontiers to the north. So in, there are many reasons for regarding the north as an undesirable direction in China. <coughs> so here we have the axis north to south. You notice it doesn't go through to the street, and the reason for that, of course, is to give you extra privacy. But it's not so much privacy from public gaze as privacy from evil spirits. For traditionally, it was thought that uh, evil traveled in straight lines, and therefore if you could enter with a, a bent entrance like that, a zigzag entrance, then you could avoid evil entering your house. Uh, to emphasize that, it was common to also introduce a mirror in the days when mirrors became available, either over the entrance or at the back of the entrance, so as to reflect evil out of the house. So here we have the main approach. Uh, now there is an exception to this rule that the entrance is a bent entrance, and that exception is if the family were important, an important family. Uh, related to the royal family or major nobility, then their importance had to be expressed by a central entrance. And the main entrance was actually on the street then. Uh, this this uh, transverse uh, courtyard is clearly where goods would be delivered, where servants would work. In fact, it's where male servants lived. It's also where horses would be stabled. Uh, and so, uh, that allowed the family to be private. Uh, when you come into the courtyard, you notice that apart from the main drive to the great hall of the ancestors at the end, uh, there is a cross axis. And the cross axis is to two other halls almost equally important, also quite large. Uh, and those halls are for members of the family who are not living in the main hall. The main hall would be the residence, of course, of the senior member of the family, male or woman, and a spouse, and uh, perhaps some unmarried children. And these two side halls would tend to be for 
married members of the family. Uh, so, uh, so eldest son, uh, important members of the family who were related closely, uh, would live there. Now, you noticed I called that the Hall of the Ancestors. And the reason is, of course, that for in China, respect for the ancestors was so important that it became a major part of religious observance and ritual. And so there was always a shrine of the ancestors on the axis at the end of that, at the back of that hall, usually on the axis. Sometimes it turned at right angles, but usually it was at the back of the hall. Now, where was cooking done? Obviously not in the servants' entrance hall, court. It was done next to the main hall, and there were two open-air courts where fires could be made, and usually rooms associated with them for the storage of goods related to cooking. And then you see there's another courtyard at the back, a another transverse courtyard, and that is the courtyard in which the women servants lived, who looked after the children and the family, and had to be kept separate from the men servants, of course. And that, that was also the area, of course, where goods could be brought in for cooking. So sometimes there, not always, but sometimes there's a, a, a back door as well, onto a back street, or onto a main street on the northern side. So the, the, the elements to notice are the very high surrounding wall, true of every Chinese house, that there is a central courtyard, which is the main courtyard for life, that on it is a cross-axial plan and three main elements. Uh, that there's a central door into that living space, which may or may not extend to the street. That there's nearly always an entrance transverse court, and often in a large house, and transverse court at the back as well. This is the entrance from the street, looking in at a solid wall, which is called a shadow wall in China, which is the wall that stopped the evil spirits coming through into the house. So here we are in the, we've gone in through that doorway I showed you, and here we've entered the transverse entrance court. And on the left, we have the entrance to the main house, up a flight of steps, centralized entrance. So here we are looking, up, we've gone up the steps, we're looking into the courtyard of the main house through the gateway, centralized gateway of the main court. What you're looking at, of course, is some children's uh, uh, stools and chairs, uh, and that is due to the fact that this house was expropriated by the government and made into a school for young children. Here we are then in the main court, and you notice that the Hall of the Ancestors has a higher roof than in the side halls, uh, slightly lower, but also very large. All of them approached up steps. Looking in the other direction, and now we're standing next to the Hall of the Ancestors, looking at, a, at one of the side halls. So that's the Hall of the Ancestors and the side hall. And here we are looking from the Hall of the Ancestors down the axis to the entrance from the street, from entrance from the transverse uh, entrance court. Now we've gone inside, and we see immediately that the uh, whole house is lit with uh, high doors and windows which are, have um, rice paper over wooden screens. Uh, so you don't get any insulation from the cold. Uh, we'll discuss that later on. But you do get a lot of light into the interior. Now, if you go um, all over the central and eastern part of China, you will find the houses are basically the same. Slight variations, but the principles that I've explained to you are there over and over again. The entrance there, entrance court, centralized into the main living area. Three elements, same thing, cooking courts, and in this case, a, a court at the back, for, which are for a reason that I'll explain later. Uh, so looking down the very big hall, 
for the ancestors, the side halls, the entrance gate, the entrance court. Well, going back to going back a thousand years to a, a scroll painting, we see a, the, the court of a nobleman. Uh, this is the house of a nobleman, and it has an, a, a, a hall, which I'll describe a bit more in a minute, for receiving visitors, which is centralized. And it also has a centralized entrance from the street. This is to emphasize his importance. And palaces would have had the same, as you'll see later on, too. They always had a centralized entrance from the street. Notice how the horses are saddled, uh, are kept uh, saddled next to the entrance. Uh, people can arrive in a bullock cart. A few trees in the street. Now, uh, I mentioned in that example a hall for the visitors. And here is a hall for the visitors. So the hall of the ancestors in this case, so this first court in this case, well, actually the first court, first court is that one, which is the servants' court. And then you go into the main court, but it isn't the main court. It's only a court for visitors. And so the main house is now divided into two zones with two courtyards. And in the middle of those is this hall for entertainment. Uh, and this is the house of a, a more important, richer inhabitant. He may also be a local judge and have to deal with a lot of business in his house. And so he has a hall for that purpose as well. In the private living court, you get a central inter inner entrance and then three elements as before. And at the back, you have a transverse court for the women servants. Here is in a, such a grand house, the entrance into the uh, main living part of the house, showing how grand that second entrance can be. Sometimes they did away, this is a very old house, and sometimes they did away with the entrance courtyard. So now the visitor's courtyard becomes the entrance courtyard. It's all in one. So the, you, you came in here, and then you were confronted by the main visitor's hall, and some side buildings. Uh, uh, it's rather beautifully designed. And then you went from the visitor hall through it in this early example into the private court of the family. So the earlier houses that we know of, and of course being in wood and the climate not being very kind, it's rather an extreme climate in many parts of China, we don't have a great number of early buildings left. Uh, but where we have got evidence of early houses, we do find simpler plans. So that's the, the plan of this kind of house. You notice, I think it's incorrectly labeled. This is, this is a, a modern use of the house to have the kitchen there. It should be up here. The guests certainly might have stayed there and some of the grown up children stayed there. The guest hall with a door at the back which was normally kept closed, entering into the private house. And so we're going into such a house. Here is the main door from the street, rather grand. And now we're in the, the visitor's courtyard, the entrance courtyard, looking at the hall of entertainment. And now we've gone into the private hall of the house, the private courtyard, with the main hall of the ancestors at the back. You notice the children are very heavily dressed. Uh, and that ex strange something about the way they cope with the climate. <laughs> because it was very hot in summer, they designed the room so that they could be opened for ventilation. <laughs> and uh, there would be, you could take down the, often take down the uh, rice paper screens and just have open screens for ventilation into the rooms. <laughs> but the winters were also very cold. How did they cope with that? Well, they were lucky enough to discover at a very early stage the weaving of silk. Uh, we don't know how early, but it seems to have been discovered 1000 BC or earlier. Uh, and once they had mastered the making of silk fabrics, they had a material which is an extraordinary insulator, very light. And so it was possible for the Chinese to dress in seven or eight layers of clothing and arranged to have seven or eight layers of air between the la layers of fabric. And so they could get a tremendous amount of insulation very easily. 
So it, it wasn't hard to cope with the winter by simply clothing people in uh, many layers of clothing. So here you see uh, the rooms opened up and of course the screens for decoration, uh, painted screens, uh, uh, and uh, the stone floors and a very heavy roof, which we'll come to in a moment. Again, the very heavy roof is very good for insulation in both summer and winter. Notice how much transparency there is in the room. Now, because the floor was stone, it was often very cold in winter. You're talking about the temperatures of 20 degrees below, below zero, below freezing. Uh, and so the Chinese developed a very clever way of coping with that. They, because they sat squat-legged squat on, uh, on the floor uh, normally, they designed a platform you could, you could squat on. And under the platform, you could put hot stones or uh, heating vessels. And so you could, on this long, uh, large, flat table, you could seat as many as eight or ten people. And they could be sitting around in a circle, having a conversation or playing games. And the whole floor would be heated from underneath. Hyper, kind of hypercost heating, but introduced into the room on top of the stone floor. Uh, and gradually, those flat tables developed sides and backs and became very large sofas. We, they're not really sofas in our sense. They're not upholstered. They are, they are made of wood. They have a flat floor. But, uh, they, and they can see, seat, as you can see, many people. But they do have raised side and back. And then at about that time, this is about uh, the uh, beginning of the Christian millennia, about 2,000 years ago, they seem to have adapted from the Persians, perhaps from the Persians, the idea of furniture, which would in involve chairs and tables. These had normally been reserved in ancient Mesopotamia and Persia for royalty and very important people. But they began to become, to become in China a way of, of uh, amplifying the range of, and of flexibility in use of furniture in relation to these large seated areas. Notice how people are draped in these many layers of silk. We don't, as I said, have architecture uh, surviving very much in China from more than about 1,300 years, is about as far back as we can go for wooden architecture. Uh, but luckily we do have some representations on engravings from 2,000 years ago. So we get a sense of what buildings were like. Well, the first thing you notice is that if you connect that, that, and that, you've got an axis, haven't you? So th and that's centralized. So this is a building, uh, the function of which we don't know for sure. Uh, some interpreters think that it's a temple. Some interpreters think it's a house. Uh, we do know that houses tended, in, the, in those days, particularly at the end of the Han period when it became unsettled, to have defensive towers if they were important houses. So this may be a defensive tower, but it's more likely to be a religious building with some sort of a vertical element to draw attention to it. So it's all built of wood, and it has very heavy roof of tiles for the reason that I've already discussed in talking about Indonesian architecture, and that is the problem of earthquakes and the uh, desirability of having a roof which is so heavy that it slows down the movement of the frame structure. Tile roofs are almost universal in Chinese traditional architecture, as far as we can see, although when you, in a moment I'll show you a building that is 1,000 BC, which apparently didn't have a tile roof. Notice how centralized all of that is. Notice, I'm oh, sorry, here again, the staircase. Now, we've talked about the spread of religions, but uh, Indian religions didn't spread into China very early on. And uh, the Chinese had developed their own philosophical systems and the religious beliefs in the Shang Dynasty, 1000 BC, 
of which we don't have much evidence because the books were mostly destroyed uh, in the middle of the Han Dynasty. And so uh, our knowledge of written knowledge of the Shang Dynasty is very limited. But uh, it is, it's pretty certain that the Shang Dynasty had already developed uh, very strong religious ideas uh, in a thousand, around 1000 BC. And these ideas were very much codified into the philosophy of Confucius and the philosophy of Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu is, is a rather fictional character. We don't know whether he ever existed. But he, if he did, we don't know for sure anything about his life. Uh, but Confucius we know more about. He was a, a, a minor government official who was admired for his intelligence and skill and employed in a number of successive number of kingdoms and in the course of all of this developed very strong views about the importance of order in society. I think if any of us stop to think about what makes our life comfortable, what makes our life possible the way we live it today, we have to come to the conclusion it's due to order. We couldn't have all the benefits we have had we not depended on thousands of other people who have developed the inventions we use, who have developed the, uh, the comforts that we are able to enjoy, who have made our society stable. We owe everything to a huge number of people who lived before us and are living with us now, who maintain that order. And Confucius became very aware of that and decided that the important harmony of life was due to order. And so it became necessary to respect order in society. So what would that order come from? It would, it would come from playing your role in society and respecting other people's role. Not trying, trying to infringe on their rights, not trying to infringe on their role, uh, but also expecting them in return to respect you. Uh, so that kind of mutual interdependence in the order of society became the fundamental philosophy of Confucius. Uh, and he propounded it in a number of writings which were connected, collected as the Analects, which came down to us and were, of course, uh, in, embroidered upon by many disciples. Uh, Lao Tzu, on the other hand, was a person who believed in the importance of accepting life as it was. The importance of uh, allowing the water to pass over you, the waves to pass over you. <coughs> he pointed out that although uh, we feel that uh, life it can be worn away and destroyed. In fact, stones can last in the bottom of a stream for thousands of years. It's true they will be slowly worn by the water, a, a material which apparently hasn't got the power to wear a stone away, but does it with time. Uh, so this passage of time is something that you allow to go over your head and, and, keep, and keep, you keep your calm you keep your integrity and allow things to happen around you. <clears throat> this to him was nature. This was the natural phenomenon of life. So we, he urged all people to be like the stones in the riverbed and allow the water to pass over them. <clears throat> and so for Lao Tzu, apparently, and again I say he may be a fictional character or we know little about him, but his, the teachings of the people who followed this philosophy which came to be called Taoism, was that we are one with nature, we have to accept it, and we have to live with nature and not fight against it. And both philosophies were opposed to violence and aggression. Both philosophies felt that one could only be happy by uh, avoiding aggression, in the case of Confucius, by respecting order and respecting others, in the case of Lao Tzu, by allowing things to happen around you without reacting aggressively. <clears throat> Both these philosophies became 
very central to the Han Dynasty. During the Han Dynasty, they grew in importance, and therefore there was no room for Buddhism or for any external religion. Uh, now, it's very curious that you could have two philosophies being accepted at the same time and gradually becoming institutionalized religions. How could that happen? Well, the explanation is given as being that you were a Confucian in the, day, in the daytime and a, a Taoist at night. That is, you respected during the day, your working day all the uh, ideas of Confucius for the need for order and respect. And then at night, you could relax and become an individual and cultivate your own reaction to the environment around you. Chinese, apparently in the Confucian period, I'm sorry, in the Han Dynasty period, were both Confucians and Taoists. And the two religions existed side by side with their own temples. People went and, play, and paid respect to them. In the Confucian temple, they would pay respect to tradition. And in the Taoist temples, they would meditate about the meaning of the universe, the meaning of life, the meaning of nature. <coughs> and both temples were apparently coexisting all over the Han Dynasty towns. <coughs> and that lasted very well as long as order was maintained, uh, as it was until the middle of the third century AD. And then, uh, for various reasons, order, order started to disintegrate. And uh, we started to find uh, peasant revolt, revolts in China, people rising up against the government, violent protests, violence increased, government order broke down, and then Buddhism began to be an, exert an influence in China. Buddhism had the appeal that it promised a, another experience a better life if you focused on avoiding material possessions, avoiding the material world, and focused on abstinence and concentrating on the life hereafter. So then there was a chance that you would uh, be uh, reborn into a better life, or if you were sufficiently enlightened, avoid re the uh, re rebirth altogether. Uh, so, Buddhism began to appeal in a way that Christianity appealed in the late Roman Empire, because they were uh, something which offered another uh, escape for the future. Yes? Um, I just have a question about when something When, <coughs> when you were classified as enlightened, was that, did you have to uh, fill in like a time yet, or you just had to be within that class life? Or did you have to have a certain time for you to go? I, I think that it all depended on your beliefs. I mean, it depended on there were different phases of, of belief. And you're quite right. Sometimes there were a series of stages you went through. In other, in other cases, in, in the case of the Buddha himself, it seems to have been a single enlightenment. Um, but the point about reincarnation was that if you were virtuous in this life and really trying to improve the world around you and yourself, then you would be more likely to be reborn in a better state than the one you'd already been in. There would be a progressive rebirth into better states. And that was the great appeal, popular appeal. And it was the appeal to the Chinese in this uh, land which was beginning to be chaotic and, un and, and unsafe uh, that had the same sort of appeal as, as Christianity had to the late Romans. There was an appeal of the afterlife, of something to look forward to that would be better than this life, better than this world. So Buddhism began to take hold in China. In the first century AD, it was known. In the second century, it, w it was there, but not very important. In the third century, it began to grow. By the fourth century, it was a very important religion in China. By the fifth, it was the main religion. And Taoism and Confucianism were in minor, de in major decline, they were becoming minor religions, and that is the period when we have so many Chinese scholars voyaging to India and Sri Lanka, and so on, to study Buddhism, 
and we have many records of those journeys. Now, Buddhism began to be a very rich religion. And uh, eventually you get uh, vast temples and vast constructions all over China uh, by the Buddhists. At that period, you begin to get the gr birth of the so-called pagoda, the, the, the special uh, Chinese and then later Japanese tower building derived from the umbrellas. Now I'm going to try and show you how that happened. <coughs> this is the oldest pagoda in China. It dates from the eighth century, early 8th century. And I had already shown you an earlier, another one in Sri Lanka from the 8th century, which was also a stepped tower like this. Do you remember? Uh, and I'd mentioned that these were uh, an attempt to create a sacred mountain uh, associated with enlightenment, but with a kind of uh, reminiscence of a stupa, because there's, on the top there is a, uh, a, a cone of uh, symbolic umbrellas made out of masonry. <coughs> now that idea, in a way, is not too far away from the watchtower that you saw in the Han Dynasty house or temple, the engraving I showed you, the, the bar relief. Yes? Why is this the first sacred mountain? Uh, ah, very good point. Well, I'll, I'll go over it again. The, the idea w uh, has, had always been that there was some, uh, in these religions, that is not in all religions, but in most religions, that there was some association between the divinities in the heavens, which they didn't understand, and uh, the divinities they thought they understood, the divinities who were interfering with human beings. For instance, the, the Brahma, in the case of the Indians, the great creator god, he would be some. He would be envisaged as living at the top of a high mountain, in association with celestial beings in the sky, and therefore he would be, have to be on a sacred mountain. And indeed, the the Hindus knew of a mountain which they la they named the mountain on which he lived. Yeah. So where does the umbrella come into it? Ah, that's an honorific. For to show that they respect him, it comes from carrying the umbrella over royal people or high priests. Um, I should mention, by the way, that the Chinese did have a, a sacred mountain, which from early times, we think from Shan Dynasty times onwards, had always been regarded in China as the most sacred mountain in China, <coughs> and which many emperors had visited deliberately in order to reach uh, a state of, of high, more perfection and higher enlightenment. So the idea of a sacred mountain was very central to China even in uh, 1000 BC, even in Shang Dynasty times. But this was then uh, adopted from Buddhist tradition in India and brought into China. So that next to the great temple of Tzu'in in Chang'an, the capital of the Tang Dynasty at this time in 704 AD, you had this tremendous tower uh, something like 300 feet high and next to the temple and drawing attention to the temple from all over the city. You've got to remember that these cities are in floodplains so the people are not used to high anything very high and to have such an immense tower rise up in the center of the town draws tremendous attention to the importance of the temple. <coughs> By the way we have descriptions of poets visiting the top of the pagoda and looking out at the view and talking about the wind and the birds. And so we know that they were allowed to go to the top and enjoy the, something very un, unusual in a floodplain, this distant view. Well, you get variations on that. And the variations begin to look more and more like a series of umbrellas. <coughs> Now that is not really very surprising when you consider that although we have the surviving stone ones, we don't have any of the surviving wooden pagodas uh, for two reasons. First of all, because it's so long ago and wood didn't last long in China. But secondly, because so many of them were actually deliberately destroyed 
by the emperor in the, in the 9th century AD, the late 8th century AD. <coughs> they were destroyed because just as Henry VIII decided that the monasteries were too rich and, um, and a burden on the country and not supporting or contributing to the country, so the, China, the Tang Dynasty emperor decided the same about the Buddhist temples. They were eating up the resources of the country and not giving anything back to the emperor for the running of the country. And so he started to destroy, deliberately destroy Buddhist temples. And so we, if there were wooden pagodas, and we, we know there were from some records, then we don't have any record of them from such a long time ago. <coughs> but the fact is that when you construct in wood, it's much easier to do a series of, of uh, relatively small stories rather than tall stories as you had in stone. And so it's much more likely that this is a, a development in wood which we see here immortalized in stone, but it is probably a development that took place first of all in wood. And then of course we do have surviving wooden pagodas. Now we have them of two types. In China itself, we have them from only 1,000 and 56 AD. That is the oldest wooden pagoda surviving in China. But we do have another extraordinary type, and that is the pagodas surviving in Japan. Well, why would we regard them as being Chinese? Because they were built by Chinese Buddhist monks in Japan. And why would they survive in Japan and not in China? Well, that's an extraordinary question, but it's a strange thing about the Japanese. Uh, that they didn't allow religious shrines to deteriorate. They replaced them and repaired every, as each wooden member would become unstable or rot, they would replace it. So the Japanese had an ancient tradition of maintaining religious sites that the Chinese don't seem to have had. Uh, and so the Japanese pagodas go back to the 7th century AD, or even maybe the end of the 6th, and we'll look at those in, later on. But here is the oldest Chinese one. And of course, you can see that it represents the, the it really represents the stupa as a series of umbrellas, doesn't it? Now, here's the interesting thing, is that inside, it contains a series of sculptural groups. And the main image being at the bottom of the seated Buddha. Of course, by this stage, we are talking about Mahayana Buddhism not Hinayana Buddhism. This is the Buddhism which did accept the Buddha being worshipped as an idol. And so here is the image of the Buddha. But an even interest, more interesting thing happened. Here is an older uh, temple building. And uh, what, in, what was happening was that the temple began to be multi-story too. So instead of having, as you had generally, a temple which very much was like a grand house with a series of single volume halls, one behind the other, transverse halls. In some of the temples, you started to get multi-storied temples. Why? Well, because you could include a grand statue protected from the weather inside, couldn't you? But normally, Taoist temples and Buddhist temples and Confucian temples were exactly the same. They were modeled on houses of a grand, grand scale with a series of transverse halls, one behind the other. Sometimes you get uh, four or five gateways and then a whole series of transverse halls. Now this is the bottom part of a plan slide. This is the top part of the same plan. And here are the series of transverse halls with the main hall in the center and behind it a private hall. I should explain the way in which the transverse halls worked in the temples was usually that the very first temple was a, a, a transverse temple, was a, a kind of a, a welcoming temple in which people would also do some meditation. The second temple would be a transverse building, would be a, a building for shrines with great sculptures in it. And the third temple at the back would be a treasury. And here is a painting from the 8th century of a, a temple. It doesn't show the centralized plan very well, but you can see the gateway 
and the first transverse temple for welcome, and behind that it has a treasury. This one only has two transverse halls. Now we can go back to earlier paintings. This is 5th century or 6th century AD. And this is presumably a temple because you can see a shrine and what appears to be a shrine in the center and a man praying some uh, respect to that shrine. This one is double storied uh, and it has axial. Uh, it has an entrance court and then an inner, inner gate and then the main shrine. So we can see the tradition of the multi-storied temple does go back in China much earlier than we have any surviving uh, physical evidence for. So I, have hoped, I hope that I have shown you the relationship between the house and the temple. Uh, the, both of them are very formal. They are both uh, symmetrical, uh, rectangular or square. They both have major elements which are transverse. So you have a series of progressions through along an axis, usually a central axis. That is a, a way of establishing a, an ordered pattern for ritual in life. And that ritual exists in the house and it exists in the temple. And at the, uh, the climax of both axes, you have the shrine of the ancestors or the main treasury of the temple, the climax of the whole progression along the axis. Absolutely, yes. No, we have very clear evidence in, his, in the Anodex that he intended for towns and houses to be laid out along uh, pa patterns which conformed to the rituals of life. And when we come to towns, which we'll do next week, you will see how strong that Confucian influence is in the pattern of the town. Was, was there any, did any influence at all Buddhism when it came to China afterwards? Yes, absolutely. In fact, they, they had to, both Taoism and Confucianism affected Chinese Buddhism. So Chinese Buddhism is not at all the same as Buddhism in the more, more southern countries. Quite different. Would, sorry, I have one more question. Yeah, yeah, go on. Would you call Buddhism a religion or a... Or a ah, theory? very, very good. I, that's very, very good. You, know, you noticed from the diagram that I put up on the wall last week. Of in way in the way in which about two weeks ago the way in which the uh, these great thinkers developed new philosophies in the sixth century B.C. But they were for them they were philosophies they weren't religions religion is something institutionalized okay? so that it takes it took several hundred years three hundred years for that to happen in China and then Confucianism became an institutionalized religion with temples. And so did Taoism. So, so religion to you doesn't necessarily equate to Buddhism? Well, it isn't for me. I think it is for the, all, nearly all the early followers of these three group, uh, great philosophers didn't think of them as religions. They became institutionalized hundreds of years later. Yeah. Ah, yes, there is, absolutely. And then that would depend on the period in history. If you were dealing with a period of chaos, and there were a number of them in Chinese history, then you would find Buddhism would grow quite fast because of the promise of a better life hereafter. Uh, uh, when, when you were living in settled times which were, were, where prosperity was around, people began, were very concerned to have th that prosperity maintained and harmonized. So harmony in social life and harmony with nature became very important. So then Taoism and Confucianism were more important in settled, prosperous times. Um, if you'd like to put it another way, uh, deep thinkers and creative people tended to be Taoists, to put Taoism first as their major belief. Uh, people who were concerned with maintaining government and law uh, they would be very concerned with Confucianism. Uh, people who were finding 
life hard because they were working long hours and laboring too hard and had not enough income would tend to be more, favor Buddhism more. And that would vary, as I said, depending on periods of hardship or periods of prosperity. I've been asked a question about the position of the pagoda in the plan. Well, the important thing was that the that no element should interfere with the access from the entrance directly to the transverse halls. So that the pagoda could not be on that access. It would have broken the progression of movement. So the pagoda has to be on one side or the other. In my experience, it's mostly on the right-hand side. I don't know where anybody here has had another experience and seen it on the left-hand side of the axis. And why, the, why, why, why it should be on the right-hand side, I'm not sure. But it's not, never on the axis. It's off to one side. Does that answer the question? OK. Now, the other point that I, perhaps I should make a little bit more is the way in which uh, the practice of religion in China differed from that in India. And that is that in Mahayana Buddhism, in India, Nepal, uh, Indonesia, Malaya, Burma, it tends to be, Buddhism tends to be a religion of making offerings and praying to idols. Um, the meditation side of it, which is present in early Buddhism, is played down more in southern Buddhism. But in Chinese Buddhism, it's much more important. Uh, what t the way that came from is possibly from Taoism, because Taoism also believed that harmonizing, being in harmony with nature, meant going out into nature and sitting and absorbing it and meditating about it. And so that idea is taken up in Chinese Buddhism. And so meditation becomes a very central thing in Chinese Buddhism. And this becomes more important as time goes on. Uh, now, the other thing that we need to look at is how far this Confucian order spread in Chinese society. Did it spread into the, the working class? Did it spread into the farm areas? Were farmhouses built? on Confucian principles of order. <coughs> well, here is a big farmhouse, and you can see that although it's very extensive because of the need for many storehouses and houses for laborers, the central element is a series of transverse halls with the largest transverse hall at the back and a central entrance up a flight of steps. So it is clearly the same sort of plan. Two courtyards, an entrance courtyard and a main living courtyard to the farmhouse. Small farmhouses, and these are associated with shops. And again, we have a single courtyard. And in, in this case, it's a double-storied building, uh, with the upper floor being the hall of the ancestors and the lower floor, floor being for business and visitors. If you take uh, another kind of uh, traditional farmhouse, you have a bent entrance, you have some workers rooms at the bottom, and then the same three hall plan with the main hall of the ancestors at the back and two side halls. <coughs> you get smaller variations of that, but it's still an absolutely symmetrical, absolutely centralized building, isn't it? With a high wall around it and a single courtyard. And again, the double story section at the back so that the hall of the ancestors is on the upper floor. And these are more examples. These particular examples are from the area between Beijing and Shanghai, but you will find variations of them in many parts of China. Uh, so here, looking at a plan uh, from uh, of the roof and then a plan below, <coughs> you see how the upper hall uh, becomes uh, just the hall of the ancestors with two private retreats on either side. Uh, and below that is a reception hall with, again, some private rooms. And the two side pavilions have become single rooms. There's only a small courtyard to the whole complex. And this one, because it's more modernized, 
has actually got an ablutions block on one side. And here is the courtyard itself. I didn't mention the roof construction. You might like to look at that roof construction as an introduction to the issue of how the Chinese handled pitched roofs. <coughs> now, you've got to remember that a, <coughs> a pitched roof in China was not just uh, a pitched roof with a galvanized roof over it or something like that. It had three layers of tiles, so it was extremely heavy. So the roof construction <coughs> becomes a central issue in Chinese uh, buildings. <coughs> so you have to have vertical columns, and then you have corbelling in wood, and the corbelling uh, carries a beam which spans across, and it in turn carries another beam higher up, and then in turn carries another beam higher up. So it's all vertical and horizontal. Notice, apart from the actual rafter that carries the tiles, there's no diagonal members. It's all horizontal and vertical. And here's a diagram through a slightly larger house. And a photograph of it. And that's the upper room with a balcony looking down into the courtyard. And the stairs going up. And in, in another farmhouse, the upper room looking down into the courtyard with a, a pair of screens with rice paper in them. And here's a slightly larger farmhouse on the edge of a lake. And it has two transverse rooms which are double storied. Before I go back to talk about roof construction, here is a typical street in one of China's most historic cities. This is Chang'an, the capital, of course, of the Tang Dynasty. Uh, and it's in its, its modern form, Xi'an. And uh, these houses probably don't date back more than 400 years. But look at the street. It is a very simple street, improved by having some shade trees. But again, the houses, all the houses have is doorways, a single doorway into each house. You get a sense of how a Shang'an house would have looked 400 years ago, 300 years ago. And you went in, and the tiles on the right are the shadow wall, the wall that is blocking the evil spirits coming in and reflecting them out again. And you're going through the bent entrance now, through the, the transverse entrance court, into the main, the axis of the main court. And now we're in the main court. These houses are now, of course, subdivided and lived in by three or four families. But here you get a sense of what the main court was like originally. So talking then about the construction, the oldest houses that have been archaeologically excavated from the 14th to 11th centuries BC seem to have had roofs which are, were thatched. They had a series of columns on a platform approached up stairs. The stairs were in the center of openings which showed that they were symmetrical. Uh, and uh, with the rooms, uh, the buildings are made up in the uh, way we've already analyzed by having a platform and then columns on top of the platform and then a roof. And the columns filled in with walls. But the centralized axial quality is already there in the Shang, in the Sh uh, Shang Dynasty houses. And so we think that the Confucian ideas go back long before Confucius. Now, as I said, the principle of uh, Chinese construction was vertical and horizontal members. <coughs> and that lack of triangulation did allow a curious thing to happen. If we go to those diagrams on the left, this is like, like this diagram is the construction system. What is actually possible is you can actually vary the shape of the rafters. So instead of just being straight like that, they can be curved like that. So Chinese traditional construction made possible the introduction of curved roofs. Here is the way in which it was done. 
Uh, the wood never went into the ground because of the danger of wood rot. Uh, so it went onto a stone uh, platform, a base, and then from the stone base it went up as a, a cross-braced structure, braced always horizontally and vertically, uh, until you got to the top, and then you had the opportunity of introducing these curved lines, which were not possible, so nearly so possible if you had triangulation. Now that introduces that question which we've already raised in the second lecture, which is where did the curved lines come from? <coughs> the Chinese have a traditional belief that they came from the idea of flying, of winged birds. Uh, but maybe they didn't. Maybe they do come back from the influence of the Dong Song culture much earlier on. However, it, the curved lines don't appear in Chinese architecture until the 6th century AD. They don't occur in Hang Dynasty architecture at all. Uh, and so uh, we simply don't, we're not sure of how they came to be introduced. But certainly uh, when they were introduced, the curved lines were not only in the cross section, but in the long elevation as well. And so you get the lifting of the eaves at the corners in the most marvelous way. Han Dynasty below, and late, uh, late five, dynast five, five kingdoms, and Tang Tan Dynasty at the top. Now, apart from that system of horizontal and verticals, and allowing the curved roof, you have another phenomenon, and that is the corbeling system. Because you can actually make the corbeling very elaborate, can't you? So you can go from a simple corbel to a multiple corbel. And that they did. So you cut down the load of the heavy roof on the wooden members by distributing it through corbeling. This is a Han Dynasty tomb, the memorial column. Uh, and so we know in the Han Dynasty that they did that. Noticing, notice how they also radiated the uh, rafters underneath the roof, the horizontal rafters, the eaves rafters. This is also a Han Dynasty, a tomb model made in terracotta of a tower with balconies. And you see how the three levels of corbelled roofs are, are carried, and the balconies too are also corbelled. For the next evidence, we go to the 6th century AD, and this is a re Japanese maintenance of a Chinese gateway to a Chinese temple, a Buddhist temple in Japan. Uh, and although the pitch of the roof has seems to have changed with time, the actual construction system seems to be original. Very simple cobbling system at the top of the columns. Next. And that starts getting more elaborate. And here is one of the oldest surviving Chinese temples. And it has very elaborate corbelling system underneath the main beams. Bracket corbelling. Uh, now, what becomes intriguing is that when you come to the eaves, the corbels are actually at an angle. And so you get gravity in interfering and you start getting counterbalance supports. So there's a tendency for these to fall down and push the eaves up. And so that system of of counterbalancing is used to strengthen the eaves. This is also a very early survival. Uh, it, it's a cave temple with a facade on it made in wood, thought to be one of the oldest wooden surviving structures, but nobody can date it for, for sure yet. Or well, they can only date it within 150 years. So it's somewhere around the 8th, 9th, 10th century. Now then you can get an, a triple gravity balancing system for the eaves. And that's what it looks like below. You see, uh, there's the, the main one, and there's another one below it, and that guy's another one on top. And then there's a cross corbelling. And it gets more and more elaborate. 
And this is a Japanese example, a, a Buddhist temple built in the Chinese style from, in the, from the 11th century. And here again, the very early Japan, uh, Chinese example from the 11th century. And look at these multiple brackets, three one above the other, all angled brackets, gravity brackets. See them at the end here very clearly. Quite amazing, isn't it? Absolutely necessary to carry the weight of the tiled roof, but also very uh, a wonderful way of, of structurally embellishing a building and making it look rich using architectural structure. And then you can get even more ambitious and you can, you can have uh, gravity brackets at different angles. And so the middle of the heavy roof is supported there by this elaborate construction, beginning to be triangulated. Now this we don't actually have as a building. This is from a Chinese manual of building published in print in 1103 AD, pointing out that Chinese were using printing 400 to 500 years before the Western world was. And so this Chinese manual of printing is designing, is producing an ideal building which has only two pairs of columns, two rows of columns, supporting a very heavy tiled roof using the bracketing system. And again, the beginnings of triangulation coming in. In Japan, we do have some fairly early surviving Buddhist Chinese roofs, which have the curve, the early curve. This one is thought to be from about 800 AD. It has the early curve, and although you can't see it underneath, fairly elaborate bracketing to support it. And this is these photographs I took in Japan. Uh, again, they are much older. They're seventh, er, either early seventh or late sixth century AD. But re probably nearly all the wood is replaced by the Japanese. You see the bracketing system here. And again there. Now, when you come to the farmhouses, they did the same sort of thing, but in a much simpler scale. scale. So this is the, char the farmhouse bracketing and the cross beams of a farmhouse. Now, I wanted to show you uh, an extraordinary film, which was made for an exhibition by the Chinese government about four years ago. <coughs> and this film is based on an 11th century, I'm sorry, early 12th century scroll. <coughs> the scroll was made around 1110 AD by an artist who wanted to celebrate the life, the wonderful life in a, a major Chinese capital city on the Yellow River as it was in, in the early 12th century. <coughs> now I have to explain what you are going to see in this uh, uh, video. <coughs> What happened after the Tang Dynasty declined, and they destroyed so many Buddhist temples, was that uh, rapidly chaos overtook China. And it remained chaotic for about 150 years. And during that period, naturally, Buddhism came back. After It, it really looked as though the Chinese emperors would succeed in ex eliminating Buddhism but they didn't succeed because of the chaos that followed their, their rule. And so <coughs> Buddhism came back as a religion, um, but Confucianism and Taoism also returned slowly over 150 years. <coughs> and order was again brought back into China in the form of two areas of control, one in the south and one in the north. These were the Song dynasties. So you have the Northern Song Dynasty and the Southern Song Dynasty. The Northern was focused on the Yellow River and the area that now has Beijing in it. But the capital city then was Kwai Fung, about <coughs> halfway down the length of the Yellow River. And this scroll was done by an artist working in Kwai Fung. Uh, the, uh, 
intervening period between the re return of settled life and order in the uh, 10th century and this scroll at the beginning of the 12th century, the intervening period was marked by uh, an amazing resurgence in population growth. It's thought that in that period, the population of China more than doubled. Now, what happens when you get population growth at such a fast rate is that not everybody can find work. Uh, you can understand if you're on a farm, you need so many people to work the farm, and after that you can't support them. So if you have too large a family, those children, some of those children will have to migrate to another place to find work. And they tended to migrate to towns. And so a, number of, a great number of new towns grew up in China. And in the towns, these people had to find work. Now, obviously, they would arrive in the town and there wouldn't be enough work for them. So they would try and invent some way of making a living. If they were interested in cooking, perhaps some of the girls might develop new recipes, invent recipes, which would make uh, their stalls more popular and they could sell the food from stalls. Or if they were carpenters, they might invent new uh, joints, a new kind of product in, in wood or in terracotta. <clears throat> so it was a period of great inventions. Indeed, this was the period when so many of the great inventions in human society were made. Uh, this is the period of printing, of gunpowder, of so many other things that came to be important in the Western world. Uh, but they were developed in China because of this increase in population and the ingenuity of so many Chinese in inventing new ways of living, new ways of earning money to live. Uh, now, this is what was celebrated in this scroll, was the, the life of people who were, making, who were developing these new industries, these new activities in a small, what was originally a small town, but Kaifeng grew very quickly to be a huge city. Uh, now, what the Chinese government did uh, four years ago was they added movement to the figures in the scroll. So they brought the town alive in a way which is hard to believe you could do without spoiling the scroll, but it's very well done. So suddenly you see the living town as it was uh, a thousand years ago. Amazing, eh? So here we see it. Qingming Shanghe II is the masterpiece of Zhang Zhedun, a Song Dynasty artist, which vividly captures the thriving life of people from the Song Dynasty in the capital city of Bianjing, today's Kaifeng. The entire piece, painted in hand scroll format, deployed the method of scattered perspective mapping. bringing in varied landscapes and numerous human characters, all dressed differently and performing various activities. Performing a drama with a flowing, rich rhythm. Vianjing City, depicted in the scroll, was the hub of the land and waterways and the passageway of all transportations at the time. After being designated as the capital, Bianjing City saw further economic and culture development. With a population of more than one million, it was truly a metropolis in all aspects. The scroll unfolds from right to left moving from the countryside progressively into the inner city. From his unique angle, 
The painter illustrates people from all walks of life and their economic activities, giving the audience a much richer perspective than if he only depicted inner city life. What differentiated the Bianjing city in Song Dynasty from her predecessors was that all the street walls were removed, transforming the former feudal closed city with fortress-like walls into an open commercial hub. Historical records tell us that there were altogether more than 6,400 households involved in businesses of all kinds that covered over 100 sectors. Restaurants or eateries in particular were the most thriving type of business. As depicted, the hustling and bustling in front of Sun Yang shop demonstrates that this restaurant is one with the highest standard. The other smaller ones were called foot shops. In addition, Numerous tea houses and cafes are scattered across all the streets. The scroll also depicts other forms of commercial activities. An inn, like the home of the official Wang, was a regular place to stay for scholars, abound in the capital city for the imperial examinations. Nearby, a labour market is naturally formed with a group of sedan carriers waiting to be hired. The Bianhe River is indispensable to the economic and commercial development of Bianjing City and therefore brought the city prosperity, which led to it being called the Golden Waterway. Accordingly, the painter Zhang Zhedun spent one third of all his efforts to capture this thriving shipping business in the early 12th century. There are two short and round-shaped ships with a loading capacity of over 500 tonnes that were docked along the river. The shipping industry thrived in the Song Dynasty and grew to a great scale as early as the year 997, producing as many as 3,000 ships. This type of ship is more convenient to operate with adjustable shaft under the mast. In the painting, there is a big ship which faces great difficulty in passing through the bridge since it cannot be towed by the boat trackers in the middle of the river. Only by lowering the mast is the ship then able to be towed past the bridge with help from over and beside the bridge. 
However, due to the fast current and the ship's position, the mast fails to recline completely, and this chaos attracts the crowd's attention. This scene, or incident, illustrated right in the middle of the entire painting, truly shows the painter's magnificent skills. The bridge, given its beautiful shape and design, is fittingly named the Rainbow Bridge. The highly advanced architecture design at that time is fully illustrated by its entire wooden structure, which has a thin shape and wide span. The Song Dynasty shipbuilding technology contributed vastly to the development of import and export trade. Merchant ships travelled across East Asia, Southeast Asia, Arab and even the Mediterranean area. Silk, porcelain and tea constitute the main export goods, while herbs, ivory and jewellery are the major imports. This herbal shop gives a glimpse of the prosperous trade during that period. Land transportation, much like the waterways in Bianjing city, is developing as well. The painting actually shows camel caravans moving slowly, fully loaded with western goods, which are said to have come all the way from the Silk Road. As the Song Dynasty cities progress with prosperity, the social standing of the citizens is raised with aspiration for a richer cultural life. Correspondingly, various street entertainment venues are formed to accommodate the citizens' favorite activities, such as storytelling, opera singing, and many other types of performances for them to relax and enjoy. Alongside these economic and cultural advancements, the Song Dynasty also witnessed great progress in the area of public health. Zhao Tai Cheng's residence, as shown in the painting, is one such illustration. Tai Cheng is the abbreviation for Imperial Doctor. The Imperial Doctor could, as his secondary occupation, also treat ordinary people thus benefiting the citizens to have both easy access as well as professional medical treatment. In the painting, there is a specially shaped well outside the Imperial Doctor's residence with low walls built of rammed earth, which serves to prevent dust from entering the well. There are many such wells in Bianjing city that have standard shape and are under proper and unified management. Before the Song Dynasty, night markets were banned. However, Zhao Kongyin, the first emperor of the Song Dynasty, ordered that there be no curfew before the Three Drum Hour, thus making Bianjing a sleepless city. This animated version of the ancient painting not only reproduces the daily daylight life of the city, but also recreates the same scenes using the nighttime lighting to bring out the charming and flourishing city in the night. There are countless such details to explore in this painting. The value of the work you have seen so far lies not only in depicting the urban life of an ancient Song Dynasty city, but also in demonstrating superb artistic skills and historical documentary value. The animated and moving painting 
deploys today's 3D digital technology and multi-screen technology, following various steps of modeling, coloring, and animation. Ultimately, to present a vivid city life of the Northern Song Dynasty. Thanks to today's advanced technology, we have a chance to witness the lifestyle of the ancient Chinese people, as well as draw inspiration from it for ourselves through this meaningful dialogue, which allows us to traverse the gaps of history. Thank you very much.